It's time for another edition of Fighting for the Faith. Wednesday, December 11th, 2013. If you're joining us live today, we have a very different program. We are doing a live debate. That's right, a live debate between Dr. James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries and Chris Pinto of Noise of Thunder Radio. Thank you for tuning in. You're listening to Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Roseboro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ, and this is the program that dishes up a daily dose of biblical discernment, the goal of which, help you to think biblically, help you to think critically, and help you compare what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. No shortage of crazy things being said out there. We take the time to slow down and stop and compare with an open Bible. Now, like I said at the beginning of the program, we're doing something a little bit different today. We're doing a live episode, and I've invited uh, on the air uh, Dr. James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries, as well as Chris Pinto, and they're going to be debating a topic regarding the uh, regarding Codex Sinaiticus. Is it a modern forgery and all of the implications that go with that? The format for the debate is pretty straightforward with opening arguments, rebuttals. There will be a cross-examination portion in there. I am going to be serving as the moderator of the debate. And um, let, me, let me introduce the gentleman that I've invited in studio, um, actually via, via the phone, and uh, that's Dr. James White and uh, Chris Pinto. Gentlemen, are you there? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, yes we're here. All right, good. Um, let, me <clears throat> let me introduce uh, Chris Pinto. Chris Pinto is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, founder of uh, Agilum Films, He's a Christian, uh, which is a Christian film ministry dedicated to defending the gospel of Jesus Christ through film and video production. He has written and directed some 10 documentaries and is also the ho- host of the Noise of Thunder radio program dedicated to exploring history and prophecy from a biblical worldview. Uh, Christian Pino, thanks for coming on uh, Fighting for the Faith. Well, thank you, Chris. It's good to be here. Okay, and uh, Dr. James White, we, uh, you know, I don't think he needs an introduction. He's uh, in the debating world, uh, known as an ultimate uh, cage fighter, um, things like that. Um, but Dr. James White is the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, host of the uh, radio program, The Dividing Line, as well as uh, Radio Free Geneva. And uh, uh, Dr. White, thank you for coming on Fighting for the Faith. I should have expected an introduction like that from you, Chris, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and did I say he was a Calvinist? And, you know, and, and, uh, we can go on. Anyway. Uh, no mystery to that. Yeah. What we will be doing um, he, he, shortly here, in fact, uh, we're going to go ahead and get into uh, the debate. Now, again, I am not a participant in this debate. I am simply going to moderate. And uh, w- we will go ahead and get started with uh, our 15 minute opening arguments. And so uh, I think without any further ado, we can just get right to it. Uh, uh, Christian Pino, are you uh, ready to get going? I'm, I'm ready. All right. Then, think, yeah. um, then without any further ado, we will go ahead and uh, you will be defending. Well, actually, the, the, the question on the table is, is Konex Sinaiticus a modern forgery? And your position is, is that um, that's, that's still an open question. Uh, you know, that, that it hasn't been determined as to whether or not that it really is authentic or not. And so that will be the position that you will be taking. Uh, Dr. White will, of course, be arguing that it is an authentic 4th century codex. And uh, with that, we will get right into it. And uh, your 15 minutes begins now. Okay, praise the Lord. Well, I must confess that I am not familiar with doing uh, formal debates of this sort. However, I've seen a few, and uh, I've always found most endearing the fact that those who debate will often begin by stating what they agree upon before entering into the uh, subject matter. In this case, I am pleased to consider that this is an in-house debate among fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that where the gospel of eternal life is concerned about this, Uh, Dr. James White and I certainly agree. Uh, While we may be part of a family that does not always get along, uh, does not always agree, nevertheless, we acknowledge that we are a family together uh, in Christ. 
Uh, we also acknowledge that the Lord has told us to take heed that no man deceive you and that we are to prove all things. And in truth, that's what this discussion is about. So that brings us to Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, is it an ancient Bible created sometime in the 4th century, as is commonly believed, or is it a modern work created in 1840 by a Greek paleographer named Constantine Simonides, which is what he said uh, in the 19th century. Uh, this very question was explored by 19th century scholar F.H.A. Scrivener in his full collation to the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, he dedicated a whole chapter to the question. Needless to say, Scrivener did not believe Simonides. He thought he was a uh, forger and a liar. But then in 1907, nearly half a century later, Another scholar named James Farrar, after re-examining the story of Simonides in depth, came to the conclusion that the matter had never been truly settled. Farrar called it, quote, an unsolved mystery of literature. Now, this whole subject came up for me uh, when I was working on my documentary series uh, on the history of the Bible. And we got into part two, which is called Tears Among the Wheat. And that's where I came across the story of Simonides. And... Uh, I remember when I first came across it, uh, I thought what most people thought. I thought that uh, Simonides was a forger, that he was a liar, that he was a trickster. But then as I looked a little bit deeper, um, I began to have questions. In 2008, I went to the British Library, and I was able to interview the curators there, Dr. Scott McKendrick and Dr. Juan Garces, who are in charge of the Codex Sinaiticus project, which is uh, the project where they, they have most of the manuscript there in their possession, and they've been scanning the pages up to the Internet now. They've launched the uh, website several years ago. But I remember talking to them about the history of the Codex, and they were somewhat vague, but they did say that they wanted to come up with a full, agreed-upon history. And I found it very interesting at the time that they, that they worded it that way. And when I saw the history that they posted, I thought it was somewhat politically correct. Um, but here's what they say on their website. They say this. Uh, they say, quote, events concerning the history of the Codex Sinaiticus from 1844 to this very day are not fully known. Hence, they are susceptible to widely divergent interpretations and recountings that are evaluated differently as to their form and essence. And so I found that to be a very interesting statement. And I think it could be said that the story of Simonides, because it's so well documented, is at least one interpretation of the possible origin of that codex. But the question is, how did it all begin? Um, in the 19th century, as many of us know, uh, a German scholar named Constantine von Tischendorf discovered the Codex Sinaiticus at St. Catherine's Monastery uh, in Egypt. And he discovered the manuscript in three phases. Uh, first, in 1844, he found the first 43 leaves. He said they had been jettisoned in a rubbish basket, uh, but he didn't come up with that story right away. He brought the leaves back. He was somewhat secretive about where he got them. Then he went back for a second trip in 1853, and there discovered a fragment of the uh, manuscript, the fragment from Genesis, he said, being used as a bookmark. Then he returns a third time in 1859. Uh, and there made the discovery of the main portion, uh, which included a complete copy of the New Testament with part of the Old, the Epistle of Barnabas, and a partial copy of the Shepherd of Hermas. And so he comes back with his manuscript, he publishes it, and it's pronounced to be the world's oldest Bible. But then in 1860, you had this Greek paleographer who was a controversial figure, there's no question, uh, named Dr. Constantine Simonides. And he came forward in 1860. He saw the first facsimiles, and he declared that this was no ancient manuscript at all, but a modern work that he had created in the years 1839 and 40, and it was intended to be a gift to the Tsar of Russia, Tsar Nicholas I. And this was a project that he had engineered uh, with his uncle Benedict on Mount Athos uh, 20 years earlier. And, uh, and then he describes the whole process in the newspapers. Now, when I first heard the story of Simonides, 
the histories that you read, typically, and if you go most anywhere for the last hundred years, the histories that you read will tell you that Simonides was a forger, uh, but not just a forger. He was the most brilliant forger, and he was a trickster and so on, uh, and that uh, he often peddled these manuscripts and this kind of thing. And at one point he claimed that he was the author of the Codex and Atticus, and that people didn't believe him, he was denounced and exposed and this kind of thing, and then that was the end of it. When I began looking into the story of Simonides, however, I remember you know, I had planned this reenactment where I had my actor and he was going to be the guy who was uh, uh, going to play Simonides. And I was going to have him sitting there working on forging a particular uh, manuscript and this kind of thing. And I said, you know, well, let me go look into this. Exactly where was Simonides found guilty of forgery? So I go and I start looking into the history. And uh, I had read somewhere that he was a convicted forger. So I go and I look up when he was convicted for forgery, and then come to find out he actually wasn't convicted as a forger. Uh, when he was brought into court, he was uh, on one occasion, uh, and he was declared not guilty. He was acquitted. Then the newspaper headlines the next day said, Simonides, no forger. Uh, then you read in different histories that, uh, supposedly, he had presented a forged copy of the Shepherd of Hermas at the University of Leipzig uh, in 1855, and that this had been exposed by Tischendorf. And Tischendorf exposed it as a forgery, and that supposedly Simonides was going to get revenge on Tischendorf by making these claims. Well, then you go and you research the Shepherd of Hermas that Simonides had that was supposedly a forgery, and you come to find out that it wasn't a forgery at all. That even though Tischendorf called it a forgery in 1856, after he discovered Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Sinaiticus had a copy of the Shepherd of Hermas in it. And when Tischendorf compared that copy of the Shepherd of Hermas with the Shepherd of Hermas that had been presented by Simonides, he realized that they matched. They matched enough so that in 1863, Tischendorf had to retract his former objections. We read about that, of course, in Philip Schaff's History of the Christian Church, Volume 2. Uh, the, but he retracted his former objections and essentially uh, had to acknowledge that Simonides had been right, that this was a genuine uh, shepherd of Hermas, and that Tischendorf had been mistaken because he thought it was a medieval forgery. So in looking into the story of Simonides, and especially this episode with the uh, Shepherd of Hermas, uh, I began to wonder uh, whether or not there were other uh, unanswered or unknown issues, because many of the historians that write about these things uh, don't tell you these kind of details. So I began looking into the details of Simonides' story, uh, and then I stumbled across the history by James Farrar. And James Farrar, in his book, Literary Forgeries, in 1907, he presents probably the most in-depth uh, analysis of Simonides. Now, he's certainly not always on Simonides' side. There are times when he is, and there's times when he isn't. There's times when he believes Simonides was a trickster and a, a forger, but then there are times when he's sympathetic toward him, and he believes that he was, in certain cases, falsely accused. But... Uh, when it comes to the subject of Codex Sinaiticus, it's interesting that Farrar did not believe that the issue had been fully settled by 1907. And that's what struck me. So I began to look into uh, the things that Farrar claimed and why he believed. Now, the Shepherd of Hermas was a big issue because in order for somebody to have been able to create the Codex Sinaiticus, he would have had to have had a copy of the Shepherd of Hermas. And the remarkable thing about that is that at that point in history, no Western scholar had ever seen a copy of the Shepherd of Hermas in Greek. It was unknown. They thought it had been lost to antiquity. And so here, this guy Simonides presents a copy of the Shepherd at the University of Leipzig in 1855 and 56. And then, what do you know? Another copy that seems to match shows up in 1859. And while there were 
uh, a lot of controversies. Probably the one that I found the most startling after the Shepherd of Hermas was the fact that Simonides claimed when he gave his lengthy description of how he created the manuscript. He talked about using vellum, for example, that was already of ancient character, that was found by him on Mount Athos. Uh, how he had written the characters in ancient Greek letters intentionally, because that was the whole point uh, for creating this codex to be a gift for the Tsar uh, of Russia. And how then he had uh, he had worked on it, and his uncle died at some point. He ran out of vellum. But then he decided to deliver it to Constantius, who was the bishop over St. Catherine's Monastery, and Constantius then delivers it to St. Catherine's Monastery by 1841, several years before it was said to be discovered by Constantine von Tischendorf. But perhaps the most remarkable thing in all of this is that while Simonides' story was being published in the newspapers, and he's given all of these details, and he's giving the names of witnesses, people who were still alive. Uh, there was uh, Constantius. There was Germanus, the scribe or the, the monk, who had carried the manuscript to St. Catherine's. There was Calistratus, another monk, who had apparently added certain corrections to the manuscript while it was at St. Catherine's monastery after it arrived. Uh, and yet, despite all of these things, it seemed that the scholars, the critics, were not interested in pursuing the matter and actually testing and proving the things that Simonides said. And Ferrari even says that they found it more convenient uh, to declare as spurious anything associated with his name. And at one point, Simonides challenged Tischendorf to a public debate. He declared that he had put special markings in the manuscript and that he could prove that he was the true author if Tischendorf would bring the manuscript to London, uh, not a facsimile, but the original, and that he would point out in public in front of all the interested scholars, uh, he would point out those places in the manuscript that proved he was the true author. And it appears that Tischendorf agreed to the debate at some point, uh, but then at the last minute he backed out. And so uh, then Simonides challenged him on that, and he said that the public were assured that at a certain point, Tischendorf was going to show up with at least part of his great codex, but the date had come and gone, he said, and uh, Tischendorf had not appeared. And so he said, let the favorers of the Synatic Codex urge him to come at once and brave the ordeal, or else forever hold their peace. And, of course, Tischendorf didn't show up. So uh, Simonides was denounced by the, the critics at the time and by most of the newspapers, although he did have some supporters, which is very interesting. Uh, there was the Literary Churchman, another publication called The Dial. There was the, uh, the curator at the Mayor Museum um, who supported him, John Elliott Hodgkin. In fact, Hodgkin continued to support him even after this whole ordeal had ended. But Simonides declared, uh, before he left Eng England in 1864, uh, he declared that he had told the truth before God. This is what he said. It was published in the papers. He said, I have no sin. Sincerely, Constantine Simonides. And then he published a final work in 1864 uh, titled The Periplus of uh, Hanan, where he restated his position and reaffirmed that he was the true author of Codex Sinaiticus. And as far as we know, he went to his grave making that claim. And so I found it very interesting in studying his story that uh, Farrar ended his analysis by saying, quote, the question, therefore, pending the acquisition of further evidence must remain among the interesting but unsolved mysteries of literature. All right. Time is up. That was uh, Chris Pinto's opening statement. Dr. White, um, let me reset the uh, the timer, you now have 15 minutes for your opening uh, argument. Waiting for you to say go. Uh, go ahead and, uh, and go. All right, thank you. 
Our debate this evening will not be easy to follow. Our time is far too short, and please remember that Brother Pinto has produced a film that is longer in runtime than most of the Lord of the Rings movies, so the danger exists that we could become completely lost in the many allegations and claims made therein. Furthermore, the majority of our audience has never seen Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, or almost any other biblical manuscript, let alone is its history common knowledge, even among seminary graduates. So the challenge this evening is great. However, may I assert that the importance of our time this evening is to be found in this fact. Mr. Pinto's thesis, namely that Sinaiticus is a modern text, written innocently in 1840, also involves a wide range of associated accusations. For it would require us to believe the Jesuits have been behind a campaign to not only alter the manuscript, but then to utilize it in company with Codex Vaticanus, and in fact almost all the papyri that have been discovered in the past 100 years, in a grand and vast conspiracy all aimed at attacking the veracity and sufficiency of Scripture. As I have engaged in the defense of Scripture, its inerrancy, and the doctrine of sola scriptura for three decades, I feel the weight of Chris Pinto's concerns. But I truly believe that his imbalance and his graying to Romanism, and especially the Jesuits, a near supernatural capacity and ability to be behind just about anything in history, results not only in an indefensible apologetic, but it actually cripples the great treasures God has provided to us in our day, treasures found in the great unsealed manuscripts of the Bible, and the invaluable papyri that enable us to defend scriptural authority and accuracy against the most challenging critics. Brother Pinto has the great advantage this evening. It is always much easier to allege than to disprove. I shall only briefly comment on the tenor and character of his film and his audio commentary on this subject, for I must invest the vast majority of my time on the real scholarly reasons why this theory is bankrupt and has been rejected universally by those who know the state of affairs in the study of the New Testament manuscript tradition. Further, I simply have to assume that the audience has viewed the film there is not sufficient time to review a film that is three hours long. My presentation this evening will not be convincing to Mr. Pinto's targeted audience. His films, in my opinion, utilize conspiratorial thinking based upon finding a Jesuit behind every bush. If you grant to Romanism that level of power and ability, almost to the point of omniscience and omnipresence, you will not find my responses to be compelling. No one, of course, can question my opposition to Romanism. Anyone who suggests I'm in league with Jesuits ought to listen to a few of my debates with them. But I strive for consistency, balance, and fairness in my criticism of even those who oppose the gospel. But this is required of us by our Christian commitment to truth. And I find Mr. Pinto's work, even though it contains many truthful statements, to be woeful lacking in fairness, balance, and accuracy. This is seen most clearly in the current film under discussion, and it's grossly imbalanced and unfair treatment of the subject matter. It seeks to make connections without providing evidence. It attacks the character of Christian men like Constantine von Tischendorf mercilessly, while ignoring any and all counter-evidence. And even when it admits documentary sources opposed its thesis, it takes the time to allege that the Jesuits were in control of the media, even in the 19th century, always a convenient way out of any factual problem. There is no way, of course, of debating such thinking. Every fact is simply dismissed as a Jesuit conspiracy. This is why I say, if you buy this way of thought, my presentation will not assist you. But for others, I would provide just one brief set of examples before moving to my key arguments about the Codex Sinaiticus. No stone is left unturned by Brother Pinto in attacking the character of Tischendorf. Yet the very sources that he gives evidence of having read, in particular the works of J.K. Eliot, James Farrer, and F.H.A. Scrivener, contain numerous statements that, if Mr. Pinto's work was to actually claim some level of fairness, accuracy, and balance, would simply have to be noted and explained. For example, he refers to Farrer's work, which is the most sympathetic of the three just named, yet he does not mention the following citations, quote, but the temptation to deceive was born of its seducing facility, and Simonides was no votary of strict veracity. Other Greeks besides Simonides had lax ideas of the value of truth, and in literary ability he surpassed all his contemporaries, but unhappily the essential element of truth formed no part of his mental constitution, speaking of Simonides. And the other often used source, that of Eliot, likewise contains these citations passed over in silence by Brother Pinto. Quote, it will be seen that well before 1862, Simonides was known as a dubious character in scholarly and literary circles. What is particularly interesting is that despite this, so many people were prepared to debate seriously Simonides' challenge to Tischendorf rather than merely ignore it or dismiss it out of hand. Then, with a subtitle of Simonides the Forger, what is surprising about the Simonides affair is not so much that it happened at all or that it lasted for over a year, but that a man with Simonides' known background had any credibility at all, end quote. These quotations from the main sources of our knowledge of this topic are directly relevant to Mr. Pinto's thesis, yet he ignores them while emphasizing all sorts of issues with Tischendorf that are not nearly as directly relevant. This is why any honest and balanced historian is truly put off by this film. 
But as I said, the key issue is not to be found in the imbalanced presentation. The film, the real issue this evening is this. Could a 19-year-old youth have produced in a relatively short period of time the manuscript we know today as Codex Sinaiticus? If he did, why is there such a mountain of evidence within the manuscript that his story is false? Who altered the manuscript after its deposition in the library at St. Catherine? Let's look at the text itself and see how the Simonides hypothesis fails the test of factuality. The Simonides theory states that a single man produced this manuscript with corrections being made by his uncle, dead by the time the controversy arose. Remember that this codex is around 1,400 pages long, written on fine but ancient parchment, vellum. Allegedly, this text was to be a gift to the Tsar, though his uncle's death ended the project for some reason. He claimed he found a very large parchment book in the library made up mainly of blank pages and used this material for the text, a claim I find highly dubious. In any case, at the ripe old age of 19, this young man, with some assistance from his uncle, produced this amazing text containing the Old and New Testaments in Greek, along with a few other works as well. But this immediately raises the first, and I believe, the most fatal flaw in the theory. Where did Simonides get the text he copied? The textual character of Sinaiticus is utterly unique. There is no manuscript like it in the world for its unique reading, let alone the number of corrections it contains. So how did Simonides come up with such a wildly unique, unique set of readings, replete with around 15,000 corrections and alterations in numerous different hands? According to Simonides, he utilized manuscripts of the Moscow Bible, along with the printed edition of Codex Alexandrinus. But as many scholars have pointed out, no known Moscow Bibles, in conjunction even with Codex Alexandrinus, could ever, ever produce the readings found in Sinaiticus. Further, collation of manuscripts takes a great deal of time. It is, of course, utterly impossible for Simonides, even with the assistance of his uncle, to both collate Old and New Testament manuscripts while then producing the ancient unsealed script of the manuscript. Such a task would take years. But still, the sources Simonides himself cites is a fatal flaw to this theory. There are far, far too many singular readings in Sinaiticus unknown in those sources. Further, Sinaiticus joins with the other early Alexandrian manuscripts, not only such as Codex Vaticanus, but far more importantly for our subject, the early papyri, in containing readings unknown in any Moscow Bible or even Codex Alexandrinus, which has a primarily Byzantine reading in the Gospels. This was indeed the first thought I had upon hearing a summary of the Simonides theory. I have had the opportunity of studying the text of the New Testament and doing textual critical work for a number of years now, and it is painfully obvious to anyone familiar with the readings of the early manuscripts the Sinaiticus is related to the early papyri and its readings, including many unique and important readings. But how can this be if it was produced by a 19-year-old with only a few sources to draw from, writing in a hurry 60 years before the papyri were discovered? Let me give two examples, one drawn from Scrivener and one drawn from my own studies. Scrivener points to Matthew 14.30, where all later manuscripts have the term boisterous after the term wind, yet Sinaiticus omits the term boisterous, as does Vaticanus, though it is inserted in Vaticanus in a later hand. The, reader was not, uh, the reading was not known, as Alexandrus does not contain this portion of Matthew, and no Moscow Bible lacks the phrase. Scrivener comments, quote, One example will illustrate our meaning, as well as a thousand, which the student may readily find for himself in the following collation, end quote. That is, there are literally thousands of places where Sinaiticus contains readings confirmed by later discoveries, discoveries unknown even in Scrivener's time in the papyri, that would have been completely unknown to Simonides or anyone living in his day. To attribute these readings to mere chance is, of course, inconceivable. The second text I will present, and will ask Mr. Pinto to explain, might be a bit better known to our audience. In John 1.18, we have a vitally important Christological text where Jesus is identified as the monogamous Theos, the unique God who exegetes, explains, makes known the Father. The reading of the later manuscripts is only begotten Son, not using the term God of Jesus here. Codex Vaticanus, and may I point out I know of no evidence of Simonides even knowing of this manuscript, let alone having access to it, has the reading Unique God at John 118. P75 and P66, the two earliest papyri copies of John, likewise have this reading. But they had not been discovered in Simonides' day. So where did he get the reading? Alexandrinus has son. The Moscow Bibles have son. And even more compelling is the fact that Sinaiticus contains a correction here, where the first corrector inserted the definite article before monogamous. This is important because it shows the reading of God is indeed that of the exemplar, not a mere scribal error in Sinaiticus. Mr. Pindo needs to explain to us where Simonides got these readings, which just happened to coincide with the papyri, which had yet to even be discovered. This textual material would be more than enough to lay the Simonides theory aside, but there is more. 
Mr. Pinto likewise needs to explain why Sinaiticus clearly shows that multiple hands produced it in concert with the others. In other words, multiple scribes produced this work, along with multiple correctors, some writing long, long after the first. Mr. Pinto has quoted Dirk Junkin's work, Scribal Habits of Codex Sinaiticus. If so, then he should know that we have been able to isolate the work of the scribes, even to the point of analyzing how they use nomina sacra, for example. That is, we can identify their habits. This is particularly the case in contrasting scribe A with scribe D. Junkin notes, quote, None of these three scribes has the same policy in using nomina sacra. They all differ in the frequency of their preferred contractions, as well as in some of the actual forms of the contraction. How can this be in Simonides' model? Who are these other scribes who work concurrently with Simonides? Junkin also notes, quote, In Sinaiticus, there is not homogeneity in the quality of copying. Different scribes produce a demonstrably different quality of text, end quote. How could this be, since Simonides did not admit to anyone else being involved other than his uncle, and he limited his participation to corrections? Furthermore, speaking of corrections, how is it that Simonides has thousands upon thousands of corrections? Uh, Sinaiticus has thousands upon thousands of corrections. These were all allegedly the work of his uncle. Why are they in different hands? Why do they draw from different textual sources? Why does uh, Simonides, for example, uh, read Haas at 1 Timothy 3.16, and his uncle allegedly, in a crude and much later hand, scribble in Theos in a nomina sacra form between the lines, while other corrections on the page are in a different ink in a different hand? I could, of course, extend these examples for the entirety of the 90 minutes of this discussion, but time will not allow this. Instead, let me close by pointing out that Mr. Pinto's professed concerns are quite noble, but he is tilting at windmills simply because he is seemingly not taking the time to study what conservative Bible-believing scholars have said about the field of textual criticism. His primary evidence of the evils of Codex Sinaiticus, which he connects with an overarching conspiracy on the part of the Jesuits to overthrow the authority of the Bible, is a citation from a BBC documentary the term lightly of anything produced by the BBC, especially when it comes to Christianity and Christian history, wherein a narrator indicates the corrections in Sinaiticus indicate the text of the New Testament was still fluid and changing in the 4th century. Rather than finding solid, believing Christian scholars who can respond to such a statement, the very character of, the, of these corrections betrays the silliness of the notion and the conclusions drawn by the rapidly anti-Christian BBC documentary, Mr. Pinto decides the real evil is not the misuse of Sinaiticus by liberals, but is Sinaiticus itself, and this is his fundamental error. Sure, folks like the BBC and atheists and all sorts of others will twist and turn any fact of history in their vain attempt to suppress the knowledge of God. What is new about that? But to think that Codex Sinaiticus is somehow this great tool of evil simply because ignorant men and women use it as a tool of evil is foolishness in the extreme. The reality is Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, Washingtonius, P52, P66, P75, P46 are great treasures that, when seen within a Christian worldview and handled fairly and accurately, are a tremendous bulwark of truth. Our New Testament is the single most widely attested document of all of antiquity. It is also the earliest documented work of antiquity. Having this wide variety of manuscripts is a great blessing, not a curse to be avoided. Mr. Pinto's desire to enshrine a particular localized text as the final authority is common but it is also foolhardy. It cannot survive apologetic examination, and it does not actually assist in the defense of the Bible. It hampers it. As such, I would highly encourage Mr. Pinto to turn his considerable talents toward a robust defense of the faith that will actually promote the cause of Christ. Such is much needed in our day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. White. I'm going to reset the timer here. Uh, Chris, you are going to have uh, 10 minutes for a... Uh, to offer a rebuttal to uh, uh, what Dr. White has said and, and expand upon your arguments. Uh, you may go. Okay. Well, um, wow, that is uh, that is a whole lot to deal with there. This is, uh, all right, well, let's, let, me, let me break down some of the things that Dr. White has talked about here uh, concerning my film. Uh, the element of the Jesuits uh, in the film. All of these things that are happening in the 19th century in the history of the Bible are happening under the backdrop or with the backdrop of what was known as the Oxford Movement in England. The Oxford Movement, the motto for the Oxford Movement was to reclaim England for Rome. If you study the uh, 19th century historian Thomas Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle, who's considered one of the greatest historians of uh, that time in 1850, right in the middle of these events, uh, said that the time in which they lived 
could be called the age of Jesuitism. That was what he, uh, that was how he defined it. In fact, uh, he said that the time was defined by Ignatius of Loyola, who was the founder of the Jesuit order, and he said Loyola was, quote, the poison fountain from which all the rivers of bitterness that now submerge the world have flowed. And this is a view, which was kind of strange to me, is uh, Dr. White, you know, is a reformed believer, but he seems to be unaware of the many historic warnings about Rome and the Jesuit order throughout history, especially in the 19th century. Uh, even if we go back to the time of the reform, you know, he's, uh, Dr. White has said, uh, that I'm, I'm attributing too many things to Rome and to the Jesuits and this kind of thing, but I think he is confusing the witness of history that I am quoting throughout my film. He's confusing history with my own opinions. Uh, let me give you a quote from John Calvin. Calvin said, quote, This I maintain, while in the present day the world is so inundated with perverse and impious doctrines, so full of all kinds of superstition, so blinded by error and sunk in idolatry, there is not one of them which has not emanated from the papacy, or at least been confirmed by it. So that was Calvin's view of the papal system. And the Jesuits are committed throughout history to defending the papal system. Uh, and this was known by uh, all of our uh, Protestant Reformed Christian forefathers, um, and, but especially in the 19th century, you had men like uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Dr. H. Grattan Guinness, J. A. Wiley. At one point, Dr. White made mention uh, that I'm suggesting that the newspapers were controlled by the Jesuits. In reality, that's not my suggestion. That is the documented history put forth by J. A. Wiley in his book on the Jesuits, their morals, maxims, and plots. Okay, so that is a again, it's a quote from a historian who lived at that time. It is not my opinion about what they were doing. Uh, let's take a minute and talk about Constantine von Tischendorf and the assertions of Dr. White that I've somehow or other misrepresented Tischendorf and done this savage attack upon him and all this other kind of stuff. I think his evaluation is simply unreasonable because I do not offer really an opinion of Tischendorf in the film. The reality is the only thing we do where Tischendorf is concerned, we document the things that he said, we document the things that he did, and the things that other people said about him. Uh, that is what we do. Uh, the primary complaint from Dr. White is that supposedly there was spooky music that was used with uh, Tischendorf, or that we neglected to include some of the pious declarations from Tisch Tischendorf, him talking about wanting to defend the faith and this kind of thing. The problem with those is, I mean, our film was just really occupied in what was going on with the Bible, not necessarily uh, an in-depth analysis of Tischendorf. And the problem with those pious declarations is that they are sometimes contradicted by other testimonies where he's concerned, um, where Simonides is concerned, and the analysis of James Farrar and the quotes from J.K. Eliot about uh, who would take Simonides seriously and this kind of thing. That's the impression that you get from some, but it's not the impression that you get from all. Uh, and Simonides had a circle of friends. Uh, he had the Mayor Museum. He was working at the Mayor Museum in London, Mr. Joseph Mayer, and the curator, John Elliot Hodgkin. Hodgkin, whose papers are still contained in the British Library to this day. He had a number of newspapers that defended Simonides, who said they believed he was wholly honorable etc. and so on. Uh, you had Alexander von Humboldt, the great uh, 19th century scientist who called Simonides an enigma. Uh, you've got uh, James Farrar. Yes, he's uh, quoting uh, areas of Simonides' dishonesty, but then he says Simonides did not always forge or invent or lie, and that most of his work was honest and laborious and useful. That's the other side of what James Farrar said that Dr. White avoided. Um, so, Simonides is a complex character. Tischendorf is likewise a complex character. Uh, and I'm not going to pretend that we portrayed them perfectly in the film, uh, but we tried to bring out sides of this history because the theme of our uh, series is the untold history of the Bible. And so to draw out those things from the pages of history that are not ordinarily known. 
Now let's take a minute and talk about the corrections in Codex Sinaiticus. In reality, Simonides identified himself, his uncle, Dionysius the scribe, and um, Calistratus, who was another monk, who all four, in a documented way, are said to have added many corrections to the manuscript. But uh, during the Q&A, maybe we'll be able to talk more about that because the whole corrections thing is a mystery that needs to be addressed. The idea of Simonides as a 19-year-old, he was known for having this enigmatic talent as a calligrapher. And uh, Farrar and others have said he most certainly could have done the work. Uh, they did not buy the, the argument uh, about his age. Probably most importantly is the textual basis that was used according to Simonides' own testimony. This is uh, where I think Dr. White has overlooked what Simonides himself said. It wasn't just the Moscow Bible and Codex Alexandrinus. It was, the, it was an edition of the Old and New Testament of the Moscow Bible that was collated with Codex Alexandrinus and an ancient Syriac Codex and three additional unnamed manuscripts of ancient character. So you had there, you had six manuscripts in total. Three of them were unnamed and have never been identified. They were all used for the textual basis of the manuscript that Simonides described. And so what would you have if you were combining all of these different manuscripts and collating them together? What you would have is a very unique collection of readings which is exactly what Codex Sinaiticus is. Uh, but without knowing what the three manuscripts are, the unnamed manuscripts are, that Simonides talked about on Mount Athos, it's virtually impossible to know whether or not the readings that Dr. White, the very specific readings that Dr. White is talking about, that have this unique character, it's impossible to know whether or not those readings could have been contained in the three unnamed manuscripts that are mentioned. Now, what's very interesting about that today is that today, uh, according to Dr. David Brown, with the Center for the Study and Preservation of the Majority Text, there are on Mount Athos, which is where Simonides claimed he created the Codex, on Mount Athos today, there are said to be at least a hundred manuscripts that have never been cataloged by the outside world, never been cataloged by any Westerner. No Westerner has ever seen them. At least a hundred manuscripts on Mount Athos itself. And then we are told by Dr. Brown that in the areas surrounding Mount Athos, you have an additional 900 manuscripts that have never been seen by the Western world. So men like Dr. White, Dr. Dan Wallace, and others, they've had no opportunity to see these manuscripts because they've never been made available. Well, it just so happens that those manuscripts are contained in the very location that Simonides claimed he created Codex Sinaiticus back in 1839 and 40. So I believe the only way that you could possibly prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that Simonides did not author the manuscript, as he said, would be uh, to go to Mount Athos and examine those unseen manuscripts and determine whether or not they contain the unique readings that Dr. White has referred to. All right. Um, let me reset the, uh, the timer here. Dr. White, you have uh, 10 minutes for your rebuttal, starting now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I begin by pointing out that, uh, again, I, I have to assume that the listener has watched the film and must have been rather amazed uh, at uh, Brother Pinto's opening statement because the entire Simonides issue does not arise until much later in the film. Hours are spent talking about the Jesuits and about the papal system and uh, everything else. And yet the term Jesuit, unless I missed it, was never once mentioned in the 15-minute opening statement. Um, it is very clear that the film is presenting a particular theory. And in his written material, uh, uh, Mr. Pinto has likewise uh, presented the idea, 
in a number of different uh, sources that, well, uh, what you really got going on here is you've, in his answer, for example, to uh, Dr. Daniel Wallace's uh, comments at ETF, um, under questions and speculation, uh, he has the, this line. Uh, is it possible that during his visits to the monastery, Konstantin von Tischendorf was working to tamper with this manuscript, just as Kalinikos claimed? Is it further possible that he deliberately removed certain pages and hid them away in a chest or somewhere else in the sacristy? And just now, we just had, well, there's all these other manuscripts that no one's ever seen, and so uh, maybe he used those. We don't know which ones they are. We don't know what they are. This is a, a, supposed to be a debate, and when you present evidence in a debate, you actually have to be able to document what it says. Um, and so here we have, well, maybe this happened, maybe that happened. The Jesuits were involved with this. A whole bunch of time was invested in, in uh, Tischendorf visiting with the Pope and, and his connection with this cardinal over here. And, and very, very clearly a complex web of conspiracy is being, is being woven here. Um, but then when we get down to the bait, well, it's, well, you know, we don't know, we can't really disprove it, it's, it's just a possibility. Uh, it's two different things, and I would just simply suggest to people, watch the film, ask yourself some simple questions. Is Tischendorf represented in an even slightly fair way? He's shown to be a buffoon, an arrogant buffoon, who's angered at things and drinking and toasting people and all the rest of this stuff. And, of course, Simonides has never presented anything like that. I think it's absolutely a given, but you have to watch the film to see it. So take a, take a look for yourself. I even posted the film today on my blog, uh, so you can watch it for yourself. And just ask yourself the question, uh, is James White being fair in his uh, discussion of that? Um, he then uh, says uh, that, well, you know, I seem to be unaware about warnings about Rome, the Jesuit order. I've taught church history since uh, 1990. Uh, I'll be teaching again in Ukraine uh, in uh, next spring, actually in February. Uh, I'm well aware of the warnings about Rome, and again, I've been involved in dealing with Roman Catholicism and debating Roman Catholics uh, for many, many years. Uh, the issue is between recognizing Rome's uh, false gospel and the fact that the Jesuits are the enemy of the gospel, and then granting them some amazing power to be everywhere and to do everything. There is no question that Jesuits uh, want to attack Sola Scriptura, which is why I've de debated that subject more often than any other in my debates against Roman Catholics. Uh, but to use them as the glue to hold together disparate assertions when you don't have facts. Uh, well, you know, he, uh, Tischendorf must have met with the Jesuits, and so he's going, to, he's going to St. Catherine's, and it's taken him all these years to keep altering the manuscript, you see, to try to make it look older, and uh, that's what's being suggested. No evidence can be brought forth of it, of course, but that's what's being suggested. And it's that kind of overarching power, that kind of ability, uh, that I am questioning. Um, uh, I would even disagree with the quotation from John Calvin. Uh, the papacy was not the source of all the evils in the world. Calvin just simply didn't know about Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and what was going on in the rest of the world. Uh, if you want to just limit that uh, statement to... Uh, to Europe, well, okay, maybe, but he was a product of his day, and there's all sorts of evil that comes from other sources. And uh, when we get outside of our narrow confines of conflict, we discover that that's the case it is. Um, just simply because J.A. Wiley said something doesn't make it a fact. And Mr. Penno just said, well, it's, it's written in his book. Well, yeah, Alberto Rivera and Jack Chick have written a lot of things, too. That doesn't make them facts. Uh, the whole, again, the point was that there, there was strong response to Simonides, and in the film, the assertion was made right then, that's when you have the Wiley quote, that the Jesuits were in charge of the media. Well, what is that supposed to communicate? Was that just happenstance that, oh, and by the way, uh, this is what's going on? No, obviously, what was being communicated by Mr. Pinto is that, well, yeah, all these people that were against Simonides and all these things about the, the trial he had in Germany and, and why he was let off and uh, rusty nails and everything else, all that stuff, um, you know, you've got to realize, you know, the Jesuits are involved in this. And once you get the Jesuits involved, then it's real easy to hold your conspiracy theory together because any evidence that is against your, your conspiracy theory can just simply be chalked up to uh, the Jesuits. The Jesuits did this, the Jesuits did that. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to provide any documentation. You just throw a Jesuit in there, throw him up on the screen, as long black uh, Cossack, and uh, doing something evil, and uh, all, is, all is well. Make sure you talk about the Inquisition and the number of people dying in ovens, and uh, which, again, was the vast majority of what this film was about. 
and you throw it all together, and that's how you have your conspiracy theory. Now, here at the end, it's fascinating. Um, uh, the the discussion of the textual material is extremely important to me. So, what we just had presented to us was this theory. Well, yes, he used the Moscow Bible and he used Codex Alexandrus, but he also used three other manuscripts, and we have no idea what they are. And maybe they contain all these different readings that anticipate the papyri, but they've never been found, so we can never really disprove it. Um, okay, uh, there you go. There's, there's your answer. Uh, is that really how historical inquiry is done? Uh, where are these manuscripts? Uh, can they, you know, what did they contain? How would, they, how would these three manuscripts anticipate the wide and divergent ranges of readings that Sinaiticus contained that are also found in the papyri. Uh, does that mean that these were purely early Alexandrian manuscripts? They must have been extremely ancient, even earlier than Sinaiticus itself. They would be massive treasures. Where are they today? Uh, and how does that answer the question of the scribes? Because even if you allow for these other monks to have done some of these corrections, it was Simonides, whose great skill as a calligrapher, is brought forth by Mr. Pinto and others as the basis for his supposedly being able to do this. Why are there different hands? Who are these different scribes? Who is scribe A? Why does scribe A have a completely different way of handling the exemplars than scribe D does? Why is scribe D more accurate than scribe A? How can scribe A and D interact with one another and even uh, plan uh, copying different portions of the same book and interact with one another? Who were these people? According to the Simonides, who would not have known of the different hands in Codex Sinaiticus, um, he's the one who did the writing, and then the corrections are made by other people. So you might be able to explain the, the other corrections in that way, but you're not going to be able to explain the different scribes in that way. It simply doesn't make any sense. And so we have a real problem here. We have unnamed sources. Anonymous sources being brought forward as being, well, uh, you, you answer it by pointing to manuscripts that no one has ever seen. He must have had all those uh, readings over there. But that doesn't explain, then, uh, why he, in writing a book that's supposed to be given to the Tsar, it's supposed to be a gift, it's just supposed to look like the ancient, how, I just don't believe, and I'll, I'll ask Mr. Pinto during the, the Q&A, has he ever collated a manuscript? Collation of manuscripts is a massively long process. It takes forever. And so if you want to collate the Moscow Bibles with Alexandrinus, and now with three evidently extremely ancient Alexandrian codices that no one's ever seen, that process alone, done by one individual at 19 years of age who is not learned in that area, you can say he's a great calligrapher all you want, but collation of manuscripts and calligraphy are two different things. The amount of time that it would take to do a collation of those manuscripts in that way would be massive. It would be huge. So now you've got to write all these millions of unsealed characters, somehow manage to do it in three or four different hands, throw the corrections in, and collate all these manuscripts in a brief period of time, and that's what we're supposed to believe uh, is, is being done here. And then you bring the Jesuits in who aged the manuscript and turn it into something the BBC can use a few hundred years later to attack everyone's face. Uh, this is why uh, I think the vast majority of uh, Christian scholarship does not accept this particular theory, uh, because they recognize the simple impossibilities of the time frames involved, given the materials that, themselves, that, that are actually cited uh, by the sources. Thank you. All right. Let me... Um change the timer up again here. Um, Mr. Pinto, you will have 15 minutes to do Q&A cross-examination of uh, Dr. White, and uh, your time begins now. All right, Dr. White. Um, yeah, you've got J.K. Elliott's book, and so you have read the various newspaper articles there, et cetera, and so on. So then you know that Simonides, when he was in London, he had in his possession some 2,000 manuscripts that were housed uh, by Mr. Charles Stewart and his brother. Okay, and this is written about, Eliot talks about this in his book. 
those manuscripts were seen by people. In fact, uh, Stuart at one point writes a letter, although I think that's published in the Periplus of Hannon, uh, but he writes a letter where he's inviting people to come, and of course people come over and they look at Simonides' manuscripts, and they examine them, and uh, he says Mr. Simonides is always very open with people. He's willing to explain to them about uh, these works of antiquity, etc., and so on. Um, have you ever sought out what happened to the 2,000 manuscripts that Simonides had, reportedly had, in London? I'm not sure of the relevance of the question, but I, I will answer it. Uh, Eliot's uh, work provides numerous sources that go back and forth. There were those like Stuart who were uh, almost uh, sycophantal in their, in their defense of, uh, of uh, Simonides. Uh, there were others on the other side. There were people in the middle. Um, and there's all sorts of disputes as to what was and was not displayed. Simonides at times would say, for example, that he actually displayed um, amazing manuscripts, including claiming to have one of Matthew that was uh, dictated within like 15 years of Matthew's death and, and so on and so forth, that to my knowledge no one uh, from any perspective actually believes to be uh, real today uh, and is utilized in, in any form of Christian scholarship whatsoever. There's tremendous um, uh, argument about what he possessed, who examined it, when they examined it. There's all sorts of problems as to dates, um, where he was, when he was there, it, it's one of the things that makes the book very, very difficult to even follow, is because well, of all of the massive differences there. So in, in the idea of following these things out, I would love to see the alleged manuscript of Matthew. I would love to see the alleged manuscript from the first century of the Kama Johannium. Uh, the last I've heard of any of these was allegedly at uh, Liverpool, but I see no evidence that they're still there. But if you're asking, have I traveled to Liverpool and traveled around the United Kingdom looking for these things, uh, no, I have not done that. All right, well, my reason for asking the question uh, is because what, what we're just based upon the available records, and, and I would, you know, you, you made a number of statements in your comment there about things as though I'm just throwing them out there, I'm making things up and this sort of thing. And what I'm trying to get you to realize is that th these are the things that are documented in the pages of history. So my point is... Is that, is that a question? It's, well, I'm trying to find I'm, the question here. All right, I'm coming to a question there. Coming to a question. My question is... Is it not possible that within those 2,000 manuscripts that there could be the readings that you are uh, referring to in Codex Sinaiticus, the unique readings? Is that not well, possible? I don't remember ever saying that you made anything up or just create anything out of air. Uh, what I was saying that the connections that you make um, are, are, are not functional as far as a, a historian is concerned. But in response to your question, uh, anything is possible, but that is not how you do history. When you say, is it possible that the, uh, within these alleged manuscripts, which Simonides himself did not claim to have used all 2,000 of these, uh, that there are unique readings that would be reflected in the Sinaiticus? Yes, but what you don't seem to understand, Mr. Pendo, is the concept of a text type. And uh, the same thing is true of the fact that you can find Byzantine readings in certain ancient manuscripts. That does not make that manuscript a Byzantine manuscript. There is such a thing as, as readings taken together that identifies a particular text type. And the idea that amongst these 2,000 manuscripts, many of which were not of New Testament books, by the way, according to Eliot's uh, citations from the newspaper articles, but the idea that, that somehow amongst there you might be able to find a reading over here, might be able to find a reading over there, does not have any meaning to what would have to have been in front of Simonides over a few months period of time in collation uh, form to be able to produce the text of Sinaiticus. You can't be running around a room with 2,000 manuscripts in it and drawing readings out, then sit down, write a few words, then get back up and do it again. It, it, it just, would, it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Well, have you been to Mount Athos? Uh, <laughs> no, I've not been to Mount Athos. You have not been to Mount Athos. Okay. Um, do you believe it is possible that within the uh, total of 15,000 manuscripts on Mount Athos, because this is where the work was done, on Mount Athos. They're, they have a total of 15,000 manuscripts there, and we are told there's at least 100 manuscripts on Mount Athos itself that have never been seen by the outside world. Do you believe it's possible that among those manuscripts are the three unnamed manuscripts that Simonides mentioned in his writing? 
Uh, well, again, it's possible that the New Testament in Klingon is on, on Mount Athos, too, but I haven't been there because nobody's seen them. But, uh, again, the problem in your question is that mere possibilities are not facts in evidence. And as, if you're going to try to expand the realm of manuscripts from which Simonides could draw, you are only arguing against your position. Because, once again, to collate two manuscripts takes a long time. To collate three against each other takes even longer. To collate four becomes a real mess. And once you start doing all of this type of collation, you only have a certain amount of time, Mr. Pinto, for Simonides to produce 1,400-plus pages of excellent calligraphy. If he had just one exemplar before him, that's a possibility. If he is having to do collation of Moscow Bibles, Alexandrinus, and three more manuscripts that are allegedly, well, we don't know what they are, but they would have had to have been some of the most unique Alexandrian ancient manuscripts to ever been seen in the world, the amount of time that he now has to do that collation work, and by the way, at age 19, he wasn't trained to do collation work, to do all of that and create Sinaiticus, again, is what makes people go, nope, it's not possible. Can you think of why, when considering the paleographical assertions that were urged by F.H.A. Scribner in the 19th century, why would a scholar like James Farrar in 1907 say that the paleographical assertions urged by Mr. Scribner simply did not settle the issue? Why would he say that? Well, Farrar is not nearly the textual critic that, uh, that Scribner was. And so, again, it's fairly easy, since he's primarily writing on uh, literary issues, uh, to not understand exactly where you're not understanding right now. And that is, if you've never collated manuscripts, if you have never dealt with the unsealed text, if you've never uh, recognized the difficulty in, uh, that, that unsealed text presents, the fact that there aren't spaces between words, there's no punctuation, uh, there's different levels of the of the uh, ink in the in the in the in the in the quill, uh, the, the the structure the, the uh, material itself, whether it's vellum or papyri, all these things enter into this, and so um, I don't know why Farrer would be more likely to uh, take the position than Scrivener, but I know I know Scrivener's work, and I know Scrivener did tremendous work on numerous manuscripts. I've never seen anything else written by far as far as a textual critical material is concerned. So um, I would have to give the, uh, the nod to Scrivener, even though uh, Scrivener is writing uh, before the uh, papyri, and therefore just like anyone who depends on Dean John Burgon or anybody else before papyri is pretty much out of date, um, he's dated, still I would give him the nod at that point for that reason. All right, well... The, but do you not think, do you not think that given the fact that Simonides, according to his own testimony, was not the one who did the full collation of these manuscripts, but that rather it was his uncle Benedict, who was an older man, a Greek Orthodox monk, who had been part of this community where primarily what they do with their lives is spend time with these manuscripts. Do you think it's not possible that his uncle Benedict could have conceived of this uh, project uh, years before and spent years doing the prep work that led to this project that he ultimately had his uh, nephew carry out. Is that not possible? Well, that would have required him to actually produce the text, because once you start doing collation, you have to come up with what your collation is going to be, what your final reading is going to be drawn from the various sources. And so, again, your, your questions are, are, to be honest with you, from a debate perspective, um, questions that, that, that demonstrate the actual thesis of the debate and, and who actually wins this debate. Because the question is not, is it possible? The question is, can it be documented? And can it be demonstrated that such is the case? And to my knowledge, I am unaware of any statement made by Simonides. I certainly didn't see anything in Eliot. If you'd like to point out something, I'd like to see it, where he indicated that Benedict had been working upon a massive collation effort, a collation work, for years prior to uh, Simonides beginning this. Everything that I have read in Eliot uh, seems to indicate that they came up with this idea uh, when Simonides arrived as the idea to give a gift to the Tsar uh, to endear the, the monastery uh, to him. 
and that the work was done in a short period of time, including the collation of manuscripts. And uh, I, I, if you'd like to show me any place where he indicates something different than that, I would be very interested in seeing it. Uh, but okay, it well, still... let, me, let me ask you another question then, since you brought that up. Uh, when he actually describes this, he says uh, that Benedict had a copy of the Moscow edition of the Old and New Testament, collated it with my assistance with three only of the ancient copies, which he had long before, these three manuscripts, which he had long before annotated and corrected for another purpose and cleared their text by this collation from remarkable clerical errors. Would well, that right, indicate, in your opinion? Well, right there, you just, yeah, right there you, you just gave him the information. That citation, that, no, no, what, what, is, what did the beginning of that citation say? That it, it, may, it mentions those, and it specifically says, with Simonides' help. Now, the three manuscripts, whatever they were, uh, he may have done work on them before, but the collation with the Moscow Bible, Alexandrinus, these manuscripts in the production of uh, Sinaiticus takes place with Simonides' help, and he hadn't been there. He was only there a certain period of time. So all, you, all that does, let's, let's say, let's say the, the, the assistance that does for you there is gives you one source instead of three that has to be collated over there that still has to be collated together with Alexandrinus and with um, the Moscow Bible in the presence of Simonides. So you still have three sources that have to be collated together at that particular point in time with the assistance of Simonides. And, and again, now, now, and what this raises in the mind of the scholar who works in textual critical material is if in your theory, and this is, this is a theory that we I have to point out has not been given a single bit of factual evidence, if your theory is that these three texts, and notice says he cleared them of errors, if these three, in fact, I think what you just cited pretty much ends off of this, because think about what you just said. He had cleared those three of errors. On what basis? What was the basic text at Mount Athos? We know what the basic text of Eastern Orthodoxy is. It's the Byzantine text type. So if he cleared them of errors, it wouldn't have been Alexandrian because that would have been the most unlike the Byzantine text type. And so if he had cleared them of errors beforehand, there has to be a standard by which that they have been cleared of errors. And that would have made, brought them into conformity with the Moscow Bible, not into disconformity with that. And so if your theory is, here's our Alexandrian readings, this is where the unique readings come from these three, you just cited something that argues against that if he had cleared them of errors. Otherwise, you have to say, Benedict didn't have any problem creating an Alexandrian text type against the ecclesiastical text that would have been used in his own monastery, and then he wants to send that to the Tsar, as if the Tsar is not going to maybe notice it. I well, mean, what would he, be the point of him using six manuscripts if he's going to make them all conform to the Moscow Bible? Why not just use the Moscow Bible? You'd have to ask him why he utilizes that, the sources that he did. Why do you use Alexandrinus? Evidently, not, to try to... Does it not evidently to you... Like, does it not sound to you like he's really describing a composite text drawn from a number of resources that then has a very unique character? Is that not what it sounds like he's describing? No, I see no evidence that his desire was to create a unique text uh, to send to the Tsar. He never says that. Where did he say, I wanted to come up with a text that would look nothing like anything the Tsar had ever seen before in its actual reading? Uh, the, the, the whole idea that, that this would be the intention is, is absolutely amazing. And it does raise the question that Scrivener himself raised. The Scrivener, as you know, actually said, you know, we don't have to say that Simonides did not, in fact, produce a manuscript during that time period. All we have to say is he's wrong about which one it was and that it wasn't this. And then he provides the reasons why that is. And one of the main reasons is exactly what we're talking about right now. And that is, you could not come up with those readings from those sources. All right. Time is up. Let me reset the uh, timer. Dr. White, you now have 15 minutes to uh, ask questions of Chris Pinto, and your time begins now. Uh, Mr. Pinto, do you uh, have facility in reading uh, uh, Koine Greek, including unsealed Greek? I do not read unsealed Greek or Koine. Um, are you trained in the collation of New Testament manuscripts? 
I am not. But uh, I read about uh, scholars and so on who, uh, who talk about collating manuscripts. What I find really interesting, James, about your comments is that the, uh, the scholars in the 19th century, uh, to, to my reading, did not think that this was an impossibly Herculean effort. There were others who believed that it was entirely possible. Okay, I, I didn't ask that question yet, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, I was asking about your uh, capacity to engage in collation. Um, so when you, make, when you make the statements that you just did in regards to uh, these three ancient manuscripts uh, that uh, were utilized, uh, indicated by Simonides, um, you don't personally have any way of evaluating how much time it would take to actually engage in a collation of these manuscripts, both Old and New Testament? Well, I'm a documentarian, so what I would do is I would document the testimony of others who do have experience with it and then determine, based upon a cross-section of their testimonies, whether or not you have a consistent witness. It's kind of like if you're sitting on a jury in a court of law and they bring in the different forensics experts. Uh, you yourself are not a forensics expert sitting on the jury. But you have to listen to the arguments, uh, see if you can pinpoint the uh, consistencies, inconsistencies. Uh, is it logical what they're telling you? Does it make sense? Or are they leaning toward a particular bias because they want to draw a certain conclusion? Because you have that tendency among people who are considered experts in a variety of fields. They will often Mr. Pinto, lean in. Mr. Pinto, do often, you have a bias in your analysis of this information in regards to Simonides, Tischendorf, and Sinaiticus? Well, uh, I can say, honestly, that you know, when I began this whole thing, uh, no, I, I don't think I do, because, uh, simply because I began believing that Simonides was a forger. I began believing what you believe and what most everybody believes. And the point that my film comes to, as I've said over and over again, anybody who studies my work knows, is that I believe... I agree with James Farrar. My understanding of what happened with these events, because there's still a number of things we don't have time to talk about today, but I believe that the issue was brought to a certain point. Simonides was denounced based upon flawed information. We haven't even gotten into the reference to the uh, ancient catalog at St. Catherine's Monastery, that a letter shows up supposedly from Mount Sinai, and in it, it says that Simonides is a liar, and the proof that he's lying is that the Codex Sinaiticus was contained in the ancient catalog at St. Catherine's Monastery. And uh, Simonides then writes back into the newspaper, and he says, I emphatically deny that the Codex Sinaiticus is contained in the ancient catalog for the simple reason that no ancient catalog exists. Uh, so then I'm reading along with this storyline in uh, Elliot's book, and I'm expecting that somebody's going to produce this ancient catalog and prove that Simonides can't possibly be right. But nobody goes after the ancient catalog. Uh, it's interesting that Scrivener makes reference to that letter, but he avoids mentioning the ancient catalog. And then Simonides is simply denounced, uh, and then he publishes his final work and then leaves England. So as I studied the story, is this an I answer, totally is this an answer to a question about bias? You, you seem to be going very, very long in, in my just asking you a simple question, and that is you, you do not believe that you have any bias in your handling of the information uh, on this particular subject at all. Is, is that what you're saying? I do not believe I do, no. Okay. So not, when not, a, you, not an unfair bias, not an, an unreasonable bias. Again, everything in the film is documented. So, uh, and when when you started when you started this project, you were not a proponent of the uh, Byzantine text type over against uh, modern critical text. Well, I wouldn't have necessarily defined it that way. I think uh, my uh, certainly my inclination, my preference would have been uh, and is uh, toward the uh, toward the the work of the Protestant Reformation, toward the work of those who laid down their lives for the cause of Christ through the Middle Ages, and an appreciation for their sacrifice and all that they did on our behalf so that we could have the Word of God in the English language. And that's really what Part 1 in my History of the Bible series deals with in A Lamp in the Dark. We're uh, talking about the struggle that 
existed for centuries prior to the 19th century. See, I don't believe you can really understand what was happening in the 19th century uh, and the struggle with Rome and the Oxford movement and all of that unless you understand the centuries that came before. So, so, so it's your position is, that the, the Byzantine text type or the Texas Receptus is the product of the Reformation? Well, I believe that the, uh, uh, the received text is the product of the Reformation, most certainly. Absolutely. So, so, so the Reformers specifically uh, chose that text over against uh, the Alexandrian text. They knew the distinction, and they made that choice purposely. Well, in your, you know, in your book on the King James Only controversy, Dr. White, uh, when you talk about the text types and families, you make this very interesting statement. You're talking about the Western text type, the Byzantine, the Alexandrian, the Caesarean, and you say, quote, in recent years, some have questioned the validity of these categories and due in part to the further study of manuscripts that defy all attempts at categorization, have suggested abandoning this type of terminology. So the idea of the text types, even you admit in your book, is something that when people actually compare all of these different readings, one manuscript with another, and so on, you, it's very difficult to argue the text type family argument. It's more of a tradition than it is a reality, based upon what you're saying in your book and based upon what I've read from other textual critics as well. So to, to say that the reformers, did they know this difference from one textual family to the other, uh, obviously, I don't think they were thinking in those terms. I think they were comparing what they thought were the best manuscripts, uh, the collective, most faithful readings, and they put together what they believed was the you know, most faithful and accurate representation of the Word of God. Okay, going That's back to your, your going back to your statement that you don't feel that you were you're biased in your response to Daniel Wallace uh, when he brought up the issue of Italiano Donati uh, visit St. Catherine. Uh, your response was, was very interesting. Um, it, it, it seemed that your response was, well, I, if you don't mind, I'll just quote you. Uh, notice that the scholars at the British Library tell us this may be a reference to Sinaiticus. They're not quite as confident as Dr. Wallace it's because Donati's description is relatively vague and can scarcely be called precise or to a T, as Dr. Wallace said. Donati writes about the Bible he saw in terms that might also apply to a thousand other works, depending on how a person defines what it means to be handsome in the world of manuscripts. We also consider that there are currently more than 3,000 manuscripts in St. Catherine's Monastery, and there may have been many more back in 1761. So um, do you think that you're handling that reference to uh, the, the fact that many people see in Vitaliano Donati a reference to Sinaiticus long before Simonides was born? Are you handling that with the same uh, consistent perspective as you would, for example, uh, the idea of these three manuscripts that Simonides claims he had access to? Do you think you're really, there's no bias in your handling of these sources? I don't think there is, uh, Dr. White, and I'll tell you why. Because the description from Donati is, here, here you're talking about a manuscript, Codex Sinaiticus, with very unique features, as you know. You've got a four-column manuscript. Uh, it's, it's, it's now today said to have 23,000 corrections, an average of 30 corrections per page. It deliberately omits the last 12 verses of Mark, which makes it very unique indeed. And it contained a copy of the Shepherd of Hermas, at least a partial copy of the Shepherd of Hermas, in Greek, uh, something that no scholar uh, had seen anywhere in the Western world. They thought it was lost to time. And so now we're to believe that that manuscript sat there one century after another. Nobody ever noticed these very unique features, even though everybody's looking for a copy of the Shepherd of Hermas. Uh, and uh, so nobody noticed it. Donati supposedly saw it. And what he describes is simply a manuscript uh, with round, a handsome manuscript with rounded script, is essentially what he says. Obviously, it, he doesn't have any of the particular details the unique characteristics, he mentions none of them in that description, right, thank, uh, which is much. provided by the British Library. Okay, thank you. Um, may I ask, why did you not include the quotes I provide from Eliot and Farrer uh, in my opening statement? Uh, your movie was three hours long. You had plenty of time to do it. There were lots of things that didn't have anything to do with your thesis that were included in the film. So uh, given that uh, both of them 
uh, came to conclusions that are that are detrimental to the the theory that you put forward. Uh, don't you think it would be incumbent upon you uh, to note that the sources that you actually are drawing from come to the conclusions that they actually uh, come to? Can you be a little bit more specific about what you mean? Uh, I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm just not sure exactly what you're asking me. Sure. Uh, I read a number of citations uh, that you did not include in my opening statement. And, Such as? Uh, okay. Um, in literary ability, he surpassed all his contemporaries, but unhappily, the essential element of truth fo- formed no part of his mental constitution. Uh, that is from Farrer. Now, that's talking about Simonides, and it's saying the essential element of truth formed no part of his mental constitution. And for Eliot, he has an entire section called Simonides the Forger, which says what is surprising about the Simonides affair is not so much that it happened at all or that it lasted for over a year, but that a man with Simonides' known background had any credibility at all. Now, you didn't include those, those quotes, uh, even though you included, I don't know, half an hour of material about Tischendorf and meeting the Pope and uh, Cardinal Ma, Archbishop, Archbishop Ma or Cardinal Ma, all that kind of stuff. Don't you think that these quotes from the sources you yourself have read would be significantly more central to the thesis than the information that actually ended up in the film? Well, right off the bat, anybody who sees the film and the section on Simonides can figure out very quickly that uh, right off the bat I let the audience know that if you do any history of Simonides, you're going to read quotes like that, that he is uh, portrayed as a forger, as a trickster, as this brilliant forger, et cetera, and so on. So it's not as though I am hiding that aspect of his character, not at all. The film makes it very clear that he was denounced, that people did not trust him, that he was suspected of being guilty of forgery. Uh, And that's not the question I asked. I didn't say that I wasn't asking about what was said at the time. The sources you yourself are quoting, the scholars that you put, you put J.K. Elliott, you put uh, James Farrer in the film, but you didn't quote their own conclusions. And Farrer's conclusion was that truthfulness was not an essential part of Simonides' character. And Elliott, well, I just, I just read you what, what he said. Don't you think that their conclusions would be relevant to the audience having an accurate understanding of uh, even the context of their own citations? Well, I think their conclusions are included in all the other denunciations of Simonides, which are, which are really assumed in the film. Um, but the, the real issue is whether or not uh, Simonides could have written the Codex Sinaiticus. So uh, while you're reading the quote there about uh, Simonides and, and his mental honesty and whatever from Farrar, you're overlooking the part where it says that in literary ability, He surpassed all of his contemporaries. You're talking about a person here who was considered to be exceedingly talented um, and had uh, great abilities. Not only that, but the circle of people who knew Simonides in that time, his close friends, Stuart Hodgkin, Mr. Joseph Mayer, uh, Sir Thomas Phillips, and others, none of them thought that he was this liar and this trickster and this swindler that he was accused of being. Thank you. Uh, and Pino, you if, if anyone, Ms. Pino, if anyone had testified that Constantine von Tischendorf had been found with rusty nails and the implements of, of forgery on his person, don't you think you would have spent maybe 20 minutes on that in your film? And yet you're aware of the fact that Lepsius made that argumentation against Simonides, uh, um, and yet that doesn't get mentioned either. Doesn't that indicate... Uh, you just said that it's assumed in the film, but um, isn't, isn't that an example of some level of bias? Well, I, I think that you're being somewhat unreasonable. I mean, there are volumes of information. You've, you've already somewhat complained a little bit about the length of my film. If I had included all of these different quotes, uh, it would have gone on and on and on. Certainly, there's a lot of information that could have been included. Uh, that did not make its way into the film. Now, the strange thing about Tischendorf is that even among those who admire Tischendorf and And generally support his work... Time, time. Okay. I apologize, gentlemen, but the cross-examination is, uh, you know, the time has run out. Um, 
We will now reset the clock and hang on a second here. Clear. And we will, uh, you will have five minutes for closing arguments. Uh, Chris Pinto, you uh, get to go first for the closing argument, and your time begins now. Well, uh, as I have said, as I make it very clear in my film, uh, Tears Among the Wheat, and in all the other materials that I've published on this subject matter, I believe that the story of Constantine Simonides and whether or not it's possible that he could have created the Codex Sinaiticus, I believe it's an unsolved mystery of literature. I agree with the conclusion that was drawn by James Farrar in 1907. And so I'm very careful in my film about what we say, about what I say and what's documented on the screen. And I did that with Tischendorf as well. Uh, I was very careful that we don't put uh, things on Tischendorf that cannot be documented through the pages of history. Uh, and where Simonides is concerned, everything that we say about Simonides is fully documented. But the story itself unfolds in a very mysterious manner. It ends in a way where Simonides is actually condemned based upon what appears to be a false accusation or a false piece of information about the uh, manuscript being contained in the ancient catalog at St. Catherine's Monastery. And so I believe the whole issue uh, was never fully concluded. And so this is what James Farrar says. Uh, he says it's unfortunate that the matter was never settled at the time that the claim was made. And he goes on from there. Uh, and I generally agree with that conclusion. Now, the reason I think this is important is because we have, in modern times, for the last 150 years, we have textual critics like Dr. James White, like Dr. Daniel Wallace at Dallas Theological Seminary, who question historic traditional readings from the Bible. Uh, uh, one of the quotes that uh, Dr. White has shared in the past on Dr. Wallace is Dr. Wallace will make reference to the story of the woman taken in adultery in uh, the Gospel of John. And Dr. Wallace will say, oh, that's my favorite story that's not in the Bible. Right, casting doubt upon that reading. Uh, the last 12 verses of Mark uh, are uh, cast doubt upon continually. Why? Because of the readings in Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus uh, and other passages. Uh, now we're being told by Dr. James White that Luke chapter 23, where Jesus is on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we're told that we should doubt this scripture as well, and that possibly it's a forgery that was inserted into manuscripts long ago, giving Christians the impression that we believe something that is false, uh, that we believe this false testimony. And part of the purpose of my film and part of the purpose of this series and part of the reason for bringing up the history of Codex Sinaiticus uh, is to say to the textual critics who are casting doubts on these historic readings in the Bible that have been handed down one century after another and represented in the greater majority of biblical manuscripts that we have throughout history. But what are they basing their doubtful disputations on? They're often basing their doubtful disputations on doubtful manuscripts that are themselves called into question, that are themselves of questionable origin. And so uh, when people see a reading uh, in their Bible, a footnote, etc., that makes a reference to Codex Sinaiticus, I believe there should be a footnote there that gives them a heads up and lets them know something about the history of this Codex. Uh, even if it is an unsolved mystery, if we look at our footnotes quite often, they're not always conclusive. They're often presenting theories. They're often presenting possibilities. They're saying, well, maybe this and maybe that, and this guy says this and this guy says that, et cetera, and so on. And we're brought to a point with these footnotes where we're not sure what to believe. But question marks are placed in our Bibles. And I think to be objective, to be fair, the readers, our Bible-believing Christian brethren, should know the truth 
about the history of the manuscripts that the modern-day textual critics uh, are basing their theories and their arguments upon. That's really the issue. That's what all this is about. So thanks for listening. All right. Let me reset the clock. Dr. White, you uh, have five minutes for your closing argument, and it begins now. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who has uh, listened. Uh, what we had there at the end is a classic King James-only argument, unfortunately, and though Mr. Pinto eschews that, uh, that identi- identification, that's what that argument was, uh, saying, well, if you're, you're casting doubt on reading the Bible. No, I want to know what the Bible originally said. I, don't know what, I do not want to know what a scribe 500 years after John thought John should have said. The Pericope adultery, the story of the woman taking adultery, is not found until the 5th century. It's first found in the most unreliable of the early manuscripts, uh, Codex Beze Cantabrigiensis. In some manuscripts, it's found in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I want to know what John wrote. I don't want to know what was inserted later. And so that's a standard traditionalist perspective, but it's the very perspective that cannot defend the accuracy of the New Testament against the attacks that are being made upon the New Testament in our day today. That kind of argumentation is not going to stand up against Bart Ehrman. That kind of argumentation is not going to stand up against John Dominic Crossan. I can tell you that because I have debated these men. And if Mr. Pinto would just understand the process that believing textual critics go through, he would recognize that his concerns are unfounded, that his concerns are based upon an ignorance and a traditionalism that while it may be very good to appeal to that for some people if you want to get them to watch your movie, is not the way to defend the Bible. And so what we've had here is the presentation of a theory. And when you ask for the most important facts to substantiate the theory, well, we don't know. The problem is tares in the wheat says it knows because it concludes with a warning against Sinaiticus. It doesn't say, well, you know, it's a possibility No, you've got this BBC documentary that's cited, you've got Jesuits everywhere, you have Mr. Pinto talking about Vaticanus and the papyri, and I just have to wonder, does Chris Pinto really believe that Vaticanus is a fraud as well? That the papyri are all part of a Jesuit conspiracy to undercut the Byzantine text? Um, Instead, what we get is, well, okay, so the Moscow Bible and Alexandrinus wouldn't really give them these readings, but there are these mystery manuscripts, and there's all sorts of manuscripts we haven't seen yet, so maybe it came from that. And as I tried to point out rather painfully, I'm afraid, and I apologize for that, uh, Mr. Pinto doesn't know what goes into a collation of a manuscript. He doesn't understand the concept of of how you collate, and you collate against the standard, and what standard uh, Benedict would have had in an Orthodox monastery. And the amount of time, we're not just talking about New Testament here. We're not just talking about Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. We're talking about the Psalter. We're talking about Isaiah. We're talking about Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Leviticus. We're talking about a huge project that would take a massive amount of time. And allegedly this is done by a 19-year-old. A 19-year-old. And then when that's pressed, it says, well, you know, Benedict might have started years beforehand, and, and then when Simonides showed up, then he already had everything done, and none of which is even hinted at. And in fact, the, the texts themselves say otherwise when you understand the process of collation and the process of textual criticism, and Mr. Pinto has admitted that he does not understand those things. And I wish he had gone to believing textual scholars, not to people who default back and run away from the attacks that are being made upon the Scriptures, because this is the whole reason that I agreed to do this and I've invested the time to do this, is Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and the papyri are a great gift given to the Church that demonstrates that the Bartermans of the world are wrong. They are a gift to the Church. They are something that we should rejoice in, that we should be thankful for. And I'm on the front lines defending these things. I just got back from South Africa. I debated Yusuf Ismail at, the univer- at, uh, at Northwest University, the old Potsdam University in South Africa, and we were debating on these very issues. And ironically, it's Mr. Pinto that's taking the argumentative position of the Muslims at that point. He doesn't know that. He isn't aware of that. I'm not, this isn't guilt by association, but he needs to be aware that they make the same kind of arguments that he's making and because they do not understand the process that's involved. So I do not believe that a 19-year-old Greek managed to produce 
Codex Sinaiticus. It, there has been no explanation of the multiple scribes, the interaction of the scribes, uh, the different inks that are used, and the corrections. That, it's all been, well, it might have been something like this, or it might have been something like that. That's not how debates are done. That's not how history is done. And thankfully, uh, I think we've been able to demonstrate that's not how we should be giving an apologetic defense uh, to the world either. Thank you very much for your listening this evening. All right. Gentlemen, thank you for uh, your time, and uh, thank you for coming on Fighting for the Faith in order to debate this important topic. And, uh, you know, and I'm certain that the, uh, the listeners, uh, although at times the debate is technical, I think that they will find that this is useful and uh, edifying for them to uh, consider. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for having thank you, Chris. us. Chris. All right. Let me... Uh, Go ahead and sign out here. If you'd uh, like to email me regarding anything you've heard on this edition or any previous editions of Fighting for the Faith, you can do so. My email address is talkback at fightingforthefaith.com, or you can subscribe on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash pirate Christian, or you can follow me on Twitter. My name there, at pirate Christian. Till tomorrow, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. <laughs>